Okay, dann äh, starten wir mal so langsam mit dem nächsten Vortrag. Ich habe vorher noch ein paar organisatorische Hinweise mal wieder. Ähm, zum einen ist es... I think this is actually the first talk at Cantina that we're having in English. Um, <laughs> no, it's perfectly fine. Um, so as the, like the major topic of this day to day at Cantina is the multi-level crisis that we are facing at the moment, we thought that uh, Russia's war on Ukraine uh, must be included also in our discussion today. And I'm glad that Volodymyr Shenko is here today uh, to present on this topic. He is currently a research associate at the Freie Universität Berlin, and he has studied sociology, social anthropology, and political science, I think, in Kiev and Budapest. And uh, he has worked primarily on social movements, on both um, right wing and left wing radical or extremism and on revolutions, and currently he's working on a collective book on the Maidan uprising. And his talk is called Russia's Invasion of Ukraine and the Post-Soviet Hegemony Crisis. And so his talk will be about the, let's say, inability of the leaders of uh, Russia or in the post-Soviet countries to provide a Uh, moral and intellectual and political leadership. And so his talk will be both about the roots and the development of this crisis, but also about the prospects for the future of a transformation of the post-Soviet region. And I'm looking forward to the talk and I now give the word to you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for the introduction. And yeah, unfortunately, I speak German not so fluently to give a lecture in German, so that would be the first English lecture here. And uh, yeah, I'll, we can start from the question, why did Putin start the war? And uh, that's probably the most urgent question that many people are asking right now and don't find uh, actually a, a very good answer to, the, to it. And many people say that They, they, continue, they basically they repeat Putin, uh, something about NATO, or, um, security threats to Russia, and so on and so forth, as if uh, uh, the security of Putin's regime is just the same as the national security of the Russian society. And on the other hand, many people uh, seriously think that Putin is just mad. Uh, he's an ideological zealot, fa fanatic, bigot, and he just hates Ukrainians, and so that's the, the whole war is about just some pure fantasy capturing his mind and uh, uh, throwing the whole country and actually like almost the whole world into some kind of like disaster that we are experiencing now and also experience in Germany. Uh, I actually believe that uh, what Putin does is in the uh, rational collective interests of the Russian ruling class. Uh, he protects uh, what the Russian ruling class needs in the long-standing class conflict in the post-Soviet societies. It's actually much more than about Russia and Ukraine. It's uh, about the whole region. But in order to... Uh, understand why is it, it is so, or at least why I believe it is so, uh, it requires quite a long lecture on what was happening in the whole post-Soviet space. And why uh, 
it, is, it has actually been a permanent crisis, and why this crisis led to the culmination in the full-scale war that is going on now in Ukraine, and why this war could actually be the end of this crisis. So, uh, and why Gramsci is actually very much relevant about it, to this, of course. So I'm going to speak about what, 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 what is this? it is uh, post-Soviet condition. Uh, I'm going to speak also about how most people who try to apply uh, Gramsci to the post-Soviet societies, they try to approach uh, uh, the problems with the concept of passive revolutions, which I believe is completely misleading in uh, our countries. And uh, what is better uh, to understand the post-Soviet societies is actually another Gramscian concept, hegemony crisis. And what we've seen in the post-Soviet societies are, have been two deficient solutions to the hegemony crisis, which were, were not able to solve the crisis. They were either simply conserving the crisis, Caesarist solution, or reproducing and intensifying the crisis via the deficient so-called Maidan revolutions. And understanding this vicious circle of Caesarism and Maidan revolutions, of two deficient solutions, we could understand better the class conflict which stands behind uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, why it could be an end to the uh, very long-standing and uh, uh, very deep uh, crisis of the post-Soviet conditions, the crisis of hegemony. So, uh, post-Soviet condition. Uh, in the 90s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, many people believed that it would be a road to democracy, that uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, even Central Asia, Caucasian countries, they would follow the road of the Central Europe. They would be democratizing like Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, as they were actually democratizing, liberalizing in 1990s. Then uh, 2000, 2010 years came, and that sounded like uh, very much a fairy tale, uh, because it was not like a kind of like democratic convergence with the Central Europe. It, it, it started to look like uh, Orban's Hungary and Kaczynski's Poland were moving towards Putin's Russia and Lukashenko's Belarus. So it was looking like not a democratic consolidation, but an authoritarian consolidation. And in this perspective, Ukraine was just kind of like about a weaker authoritarian regime where no, no candidate to a uh, strong authoritarian rule, no Ukrainian president was capable to consolidate the power and to build a kind of like a Putinist regime, but in Ukraine. So uh, other people started to say that just let's say goodbye to the post-Soviet concept. All those countries between, on the one hand, Baltic states, which are EU member states, let's, let's put the, the, the most extreme case, Estonia, which believes itself to be a kind of like almost a Nordic country now. And on the other hand, let's say Tajikistan in Central Asia, which is, they just became too divergent. And there is no even sense to speak about any post-Soviet commonality between them. So farewell to the post-Soviet concept. Uh, another response to this uh, could be that actually the, the, the very fact that we cannot define in any positive terms what is post-Soviet besides saying that this is something that followed the Soviet is actually an answer to the question. Post-Soviet has been a continuous permanent crisis when nothing new replaced the old dying Soviet structures. And that already sounds very, very much Gramscian. The moment when the old has died, but the new has not had born. Many people, however, um, who tried to speak about Gramsci in post-Soviet context, they were speaking about a passive revolution. 
I grant you, I know probably there have been already many discussions about the passive revolution. That's a central concept for Gramsci. And originally, he talked about why uh, Italy was not able to follow the route of the French Revolution, a revolution under uh, strong bourgeois hegemony. Why Italy was united by the Piemontese kingdom from above, but the initiatives of Mazzini, Garibaldi failed. And so the, the passive revolution concept existed in uh, relation to the Jacobin revolution. Italy didn't have a proper Jacobin revolution under bourgeois hegemony, so it had to modernize, it had to build a bourgeois order, it had to build the modern nation state from above via different route. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that uh, original use uh, has been kind of like forgotten. And that's also partially Gramscian fault when he started to discuss fascism as a passive revolution, American Fordism as a passive revolution. And there were some, some arguments behind this because it could look like as some other modernizing changes made by the ruling class under the new conditions, but under the conditions of the threat from a Bolshevik, from the Russian Revolution. And that's why New Deal in the United States, and that's why transformation of the Italian state by fascists. But since then, uh, the people talked about neoliberal passive revolution, some decolonization passive revolution, uh, the Mexican Revolution as a passive revolution. And of course, in, 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 in the context of the Soviet and post-Soviet societies, Stalinist passive revolution, Gorbachev passive revolution, Putin's passive revolution. And, and you now feel that this concept becomes like just too inflated. You can basically interpret every changes that are beneficial to the capitalism, but uh, which are not done under the, the revolutionary bourgeois hegemony as a passive revolution and make some sense. And of course, Gramsci and very quite obscure writings are very much um, easy to exploit in this direction. So if you, if you want to make any use, any actual use to understand, to explain and to change the world, we need stricter concepts. And if you stick to the original use in Gramsci, the passive revolution will be conservative modernization by or in compromise with the old ruling class that incorporates some of the grievances of the subaltern classes in the context, and this is crucial, of a threat of a Jacobin social revolution and in order to prevent one. So the Italian ruling class in the 19th century, they were feeling the threat of the Jacobin revolution that actually happened in, in, the, in France and was actually very much of a threat in, in the whole Europe during the 19th century. 1848 was about that, of course. But they were capable to push forward the objectively progressive changes but from the above, without challenging the rule of the old ruling class. So now if you look at the Soviet and Soviet conditions, we would see some superficial similarities with this, and well, that's why many people are speaking about post-Soviet passive revolution. So of course the Soviet elite, so-called nomenclatura, the top of the Communist Party, they were playing a very important agency in the capitalist transformation of the former Soviet Union. They were, in the process, they were turning themselves and helping to turn other people into the new capitalists. But this was a very specific kind of capitalist who, uh, whose uh, income fundamentally depended on the relations to the state. They were political capitalists. They could exploit connections to the political offices, to the specific people, to the specific parties, in order to make themselves rich. And on the other hand, the oppositional intelligentsia in the Soviet Union 
were very much like those Italian Jacobins about whom uh, Gramsci actually wrote very uh, despisingly. He despised them. So he, he saw that those Italian Jacobins were trying to use the experience of France without uh, any um, f serious application to the difference of the Italian context. And that's why they were failing. And we could see very many similarities with how the first the Soviet oppositional intelligentsia, the dissidents, and then the post-Soviet professional middle class, so, so this vibrant civil society, uh, is caught into this illusion that uh, we need to join a proper capitalism, not like our bad post-Soviet capitalism with oligarchs, with Putins, and so on and so forth, but the proper capitalism of the EU, of the United States, and actually join the so-called civilized world, join the elite. And uh, if, if, if you are in this very clearly elitist project, that helps to understand why they are, are remaining not so much popular and why they were failing to form a proper hegemony in the post-Soviet countries. Uh, but there are fundamental differences, and that's important to understand the um, basis of the, of the crisis, and it's also important to understand why passive revolution is quite a misleading concept to understand what happens. Post-Soviet transformations have never been modernization. We were not transforming into a more progressive social order, state institutions, economic institutions. This was primarily about demodernizations, about so-called involution, not evolution, but involution, uh, peripherization of our economies from the uh, economies that were capable to lead in the space race, that were capable to lead in, actually, in many uh, social achievements of the Soviet age, and that's why the Soviet Union, until some moment, 70s, 80s, was actually presenting a progressive alternative for too many third world can countries. And many revolutionary movements where they were actually trying to copy the Soviet experience. And there was a reason for that. Uh, the post-Soviet uh, transformation was very much rejection of everything that happened, and not in favor of anything more progressive. Fundamentally, the second difference, there was no actual a threat of a Jacobin, neo-Jacobin, of any social revolution. We are now actually living in the world where we do not have a social revolutions anymore. We do have many revolutions, but they do not challenge the uh, ruling classes. And I'll be speaking uh, about that a little bit later, about the so-called modern revolutions. And this is the problem that actually many uh, sociologists, many um, social scientists uh, and on the left, on the, in the mainstream, they, uh, they raise this qu question, where did the social revolutions go? Why we have the, some kind of revolutionary change of the government in, in many cases, every year, but nothing is changing. And if you do not have a threat from a Jacobin revolution, we cannot have a passive revolution. There is just no need to push for some progressive changes from above. And uh, some people just are confused about uh, the uh, things like uh, return of the Soviet anthem by Putin that he made in 2000s, or some restoration of the social benefits. Uh, uh, but this is uh, a typical Caesarist balancing. There is nothing uh, actually progressive in just making the old Soviet institutions work. And uh, uh, finally, the, uh, those intellectuals, quasi-Jacobin, post-Soviet Jacobins, they were not actually allied with the plebeian masses 
like in the 19th century Italy. They were opposed to them. They were despising them. They, they saw them as some, some backward Soviet rigid people who just vote for Putin and who are actually a part of the problem why we could, cannot join the proper capitalism of the civilized world. And so that's why there was no anything like transformismo. Uh, the individual take of the leaders of the subaltern classes and uh, integration them into the elite. For the uh, post Soviet rulers, it was better to actually to emphasize this gap between the uh, middle class opposition on the one hand and regular people who are in favor of uh, Putin or Lukashenko. So that's why this is not a passive revolution and just, just, just too many fundamental differences from what Gramsci was talking about. However, Gramsci is actually useful with the concept of uh, hegemony crisis. And of course, I, I, I believe you've been talking about like five days about this and probably this, this was the most used and misused and abused concept. And yeah, Perry Anderson just recently published a book, H Word, because just so many people use it in so many different meanings, and, um, and just not even pretending to give like a proper understanding of what is hegemony, but to point to the most substantive Gramscian fragments in the prison notebooks, where he uh, analyzes hegemony in the context of the uh, specifically political development of social classes in the degree of their homogeneity and self-consciousness. So political organization of the social classes and also the uh, consciousness development of the, of the social classes. So uh, first, he starts from the so-called economic corporate stage when merchants are organized and think about merchant interests, and industrialists are think about, thinking about industrialists' interests, and those these fractions of uh, ruling class of, or of the bottom classes are organized and mobilized just as themselves, economic corporate stage, thinking primarily about the uh, purely economic interests. But then the class consciousness stage when the uh, understanding of the interest of the whole class of bourgeoisie or proletariat uh, develops and one fraction of that class is capable to present their particular interests at the interest of the whole class. And then the, the final stage is actually hegemony. The political, intellectual and moral leadership of one class over the others. So when the interests of certain fraction of the class, certain group within the class, could be presented at the interest of the whole class, but also at the interest of other classes, and in extreme at the national interests. And uh, fundamentally, th this is not just about claim. Yeah, I'm speaking on behalf of the whole nation, but this is also uh, the capacity to at least partially fulfill the interests of other uh, groups and classes. And therefore, that's this difference between coercion and consent. The hegemonic class is capable to mobilize the rational, active, participatory consent with its leadership. And these are all very important concepts. Because it, hegemony is not just irrational manipulation, it's actually a rational understanding of the uh, intersection of our interests. It's active consent. It's not simply passive consent because I support Putin, because if not Putin, who else? It's an active consent. It's an enthusiastic consent. And it's participation. And that's why uh, hegemony requires specific institutions like political parties, civil society institutions, press, clubs, civil society organizations, which mobilize an active participatory consent with the rule of some class. But 
in the post-Soviet societies, we had rather hegemonic crisis. Fundamentally, hegemonic crisis is the crisis of political representation, where there is the break between the interest of the specific social groups and their political representatives. If hegemony is about leadership, hegemony crisis is that when we just stop believe those people who claim to be our leaders. Crisis is, is a long process. It's not necessarily an event, and Gramsci has uh, very much discussed um, distinction between organic crisis and conjunctural crisis, conjunctural something short, occasional, accidental, but organic crisis is a permanent crisis. And in this understanding, the organic crisis may last uh, for years, decades, and even centuries. Gramsci uh, wrote about the medieval hegemony crisis. And the source of the hegemony crisis could be uh, for example, the failure of the ruling class in a, some major undertaking, or a quantitative accumulation of unrest from below. And there could be organic and uh, apparently inorganic deficient solution, solution to the crisis of hegemony. Organic solution would be when the one party fails in hegemony, but another party can immediately take over the hegemony. But when it doesn't happen, we enter the hegemony crisis. And this is precisely what happened in the Soviet Union, let's say in the end of 1960s. Uh, we did have communist hegemony. So, of course, in, in Gram uh, Gr Gramsci understood the Bolshevik Revolution as the war of maneuver, where Bolsheviks came to power uh, quickly because of the weakness of the uh, Russian Empire, but basically because of its collapse. But when they came to power, they, they were very much concerned that they need to expand their role, that they need to involve the majority of the Russian societies, primarily peasants, into the new state. And so they, they did use vast terror, but at the same time, they did mobilize active participatory, rational consent with the rule of the new Soviet state via the construction of multiple hegemony institutions. The Communist Party was, of course, the most important of them, and it was the, the, the center of the new hegemony. But it was not just about the party, it was about the, the, the multiple organizations organizing the labor, women, the young people, the expansion of the press, expansion of the political discussion, the people in the Soviet Union were not scared. They were actually very much politicized. But and uh, the success of this uh, communist hegemony was actually the most evident during the years of destalinization, uh, during the so-called uh, Thor period, uh, Khrushchev rule, which actually uh, saw the massive activization of the Soviet uh, citizens who were criticizing the Soviet state, but they were criticizing it for not fulfilling the socialist ideals. That's where the uh, uh, concept of the socialism with a human face comes from. So they were so taken by by, by the communist hegemony that they were criticizing the communist party for not being proper communists, for failing in the, in the, in, in the communist uh, project. And that actually, it's, it, it's, a, it's an evidence of the strength of the communist hegemony, not its weakness. But that activization in the 1960s was um, not uh, incorporated in the Communist Party 
And the result was the start of the hegemonic crisis, when the majority of the Soviet citizens started to see the Soviet state as com completely alien from them, alien to their interests and uh, not presenting any uh, lead, le any leadership in any progressive changes in, uh, in our country. And uh, this is the start of the hegemonic crisis, which we have been actually until this moment. Uh, this crisis has started about at the end of 1960s, the beginning of the 1970s. 1968 could be kind of like a very symbolic date for the start of this crisis. And uh, the crisis was not uh, limited simply to the Soviet uh, Union. We could speak about the um, hegemony crisis in the um, Europe, in the Northern America, but the, and that's why uh, the, uh, this omnipresent discussion of the crisis of political representation, why people do not vote, why, why people vote for the, some populist parties, why they do not believe into the, in, in the mainstream parties, and so on and so forth. So there, there is something universal in this condition. But in the Soviet Union, the uh, depth of the hegemony crisis was probably the uh, strongest in the whole world. And there are several reasons for this. First, uh, the post-Soviet ruling class of political capitalists severely lacked legitimacy. They were, from the very start, perceived as thieves, as mafia, as bandits who captured the collapsing Soviet states and who exploited it, who exploited the, uh, those property, those achievements that were the result of the mobilization of the whole Soviet people uh, for their private enrichment. There was no ideological, no religious, no traditional legitimation for their rule, unlike in the um, core capitalist countries. They became rich in the matter of months, almost years. That primitive accumulation that happened in, in Europe during centuries. And, then, and that was happening in basically in our eyes. Uh, there was, of course, very limited opportunities for hegemony under the demodernization changes, where everything is contracting and the, 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 the pie cannot be uh, divided in, uh, in good pieces. Uh, there was, because of the lack of any social revolutionary threat, there was even lack of motivation to lead, not simply to dominate. And leadership, of course, requires more from the ruling class. Hegemony is more demanding kind of rule than the lack of hegemony. And finally, the, this political representation relationship was undermined both from above and also from below. From above, the new political parties in the post-Soviet countries, they were reproducing and even exacerbating, exacerbating some of the worst features of the late Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Meaningless ideology, which nobody believed in. The uh, careerism, opportunism, the uh, basically lack of any belief that a party is actually the unity of the uh, like-minded people, but not some tool to basically to to be exploited for some private interests. That's, that's, a, that's actually the, 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 the problem between economic, corporate stage and, and more like class, more like politically developed stage. The parties were not pushing the political development of the ruling class, but they were rather seen as the uh, representatives of very specific, very particular interests. But on the other hand, the, uh, even the economic corporate consciousness was weak. And for Gramsci, it was not problematized, although when we speak about the interests of merchants, miners, um, peasants, 
it's already the interest of some quite broad group, broader than informal patronage networks, ethnic groups, families, and so on. But in the uh, Soviet Union, this uh, representation of the corporate interests were repressed. They were important, but they were moved to the informal sphere. And when the structure of the communist hegemony degraded, rotten, and basically collapsed, what remained? This informal networks. And instead of the uh, interests of at least some socially bounded groups, we've got the uh, um, informally patronage structured society. When people could, uh, in very uh, contradictory way, combine a huge criticism towards the elite, as thieves and mafia, but on, a, on the other hand, instead of mobilizing uh, collectively in defense of their interests, they were uh, relying on the same uh, informal patronage channels in order to solve their problems. This is kind of like the bifurcated Philistine consciousness, which was very much predominant in our countries. Uh, yeah, so if you have hegemony crisis, what are the solutions to this? Did we have any organic solution? In fact, what we did have were the two deficient solutions. One could be uh, described with Gramscian concept of Caesarism. The uh, personalistic authoritarian rule, which consolidated in the most of the post-Soviet countries, Russia, Belarus, Azerbaijan, and most of the Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and so on. The, uh, in Gramsci, uh, Caesarism, Caesarism is a particular solution for the situation which is characterized by the equilibrium of forces heading towards catastrophe. And Caesarism is defensive restorative. It's coercion and also only passive consent of the masses. Nothing like active, enthusiastic, hegemonic support. The masses simply prefer the stability to the risk of the catastrophic changes. And Gramsci has a discussion of the uh, pre-modern and modern Caesarism types. How the Caesarist leaders who relied on military, like Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, that kind of rule transforms into the police, and from the personalistic leadership to the institutions, he even discussed whether it's possible to have a Caesarist party, and fascist could be discussed as a kind of like a Caesarist collective rule. And that the conflict of those uh, forces which head towards catastrophe uh, becomes an irreconcilable class conflict which just cannot be uh, solved based on some win-win um, uh, um, uh, resolution. In the post-Soviet countries, what we've, get, uh, what we've got, the leaders like Putin or Lukashenko, they are indeed, their major legitimating narrative was that they uh, prevented and overcome the uh, um, post-Soviet collapse. They restored some stability. And this narrative was the main legitimating um, tool in order to um, support their rule. Why people vote for Putin? Primarily because they do not see any other alternative. And, but it was not just some stability. These kind of leaders, they uh, tamed uh, the uh, centrifugal tendencies in the post-Soviet ruling class during the 1990s collapse. They consolidated it to some extent. They balanced some fractions. They uh, repressed other fractions. So they uh, played some function for consolidating the ruling class, however, not in a hegemonic way. 
Uh, however, there were also some clear specifics. So the situation was the, not, not really the symmetrical strength of the fighting social forces that lead to the disaster, but their symmetrical weakness. The weakness both of the uh, ruling class, but also of the subaltern classes. The uh, main post-Soviet post -Soviet con conflict is uh, arguably reconcilable between the quasi-Jacobin professional middle classes allied with some oppositional fractions of the ruling class against the Caesarist leaders. And in case of the post-Soviet revolutions, what we've seen is the swapping of the uh, fraction of the ruling class in power, not any ex existential challenge to the ruling class. And also, the, unlike in Gramsci, from pre-modern to modern Caesarism, we actually did uh, have a reverse situation or process, primitivization and personalization of politics. The uh, politics for the hegemony crisis, but it's conservation, preservation. The, this solution, uh, the Caesar solution was fundamental of the instability is that the personalistic authoritarian rule is uh, open to the crisis of succession. When, the, when Putin becomes, becomes too old, or Lukashenko is uh, elected as a president for fourth, fifth, sixth time, the people are just tired. And they, uh, there is a question who would succeed Lukashenko and Putin. And this question is actually a very difficult one, because you, you cannot be wrong about this person. You want to resign in a proper time, and you, want not, you, you, should not, you do not want to be removed by your chosen successor. At the same time, uh, so the successor should not be too smart, but at the same time, it should not be too dumb. And uh, the succession crisis is... another leader who would fail to fulfill their anticipations. And uh, as a result, this revolution only gives a legitimacy, say in Ukrainian case, to another oligarch, Petro Poroshenko, who wins the elections. However, he does not represent the interest of all those diverse people who came to protest in, uh, at the uh, Maidan Square in Kyiv. They legitimate only another fraction of the same old politicians who exploit the revolutionary legitimacy to push forward the agenda that does not represent the, uh, the revolutionaries, not speaking about the majority of the society. And in this way, reproduces and even intensifies the very crisis that the revolution was supposed to resolve. And this, uh, the post-Euromaidan Ukrainian leaders got into the trap between 
inflated revolutionary expectations about some fundamental changes. And on the other hand, the unpopular agendas of specific political agents who were capable to hijack the revolution. Some other oligarchic clans, the neoliberal NGOized civil society, the uh, radical nationalists, and also the Western powers, who became much more stronger in, in Ukraine. And this is why the Maidan revolutions happen so frequently and may even accelerate because of the reproduction and intensification of the hegemony crisis. And now we come to the war. So this uh, conservative, Caesarist, and kind of revolutionary solutions form basically a vicious circle. You try to consolidate the Caesarist regime. If you fail, you uh, end in a deficient revolution. Deficient revolution is not capable to establish a, a proper hegemony, and it only opens the uh, uh, space to hijack the legitimacy and to attempt to establish the new um, personalistic authoritarian regime uh, that would uh, meet the same problems. So this is kind of like a vicious circle. And the question, of course, was would it be possible to circulate in this way forever, and if not forever, for how long? And it looks like that we've got into the culmination of this crisis. It intensified until the terminal point. And that's why the war. So the uh, class conflict behind the war is fundamentally the same. So that, that conflict, which is resolved now by tanks, rockets, artillery in Ukraine, has been resolved as police batons in Russia and Belarus. In Russia and Belarus, they were capable to basically to beat people, to suppress their prices. In Ukraine, there was this circulating revolutions, three in the, uh, during the life of just one generation. And now the same uh, social class is uh, solving with even more escalated violence the same class conflict. And so that's why it's not just about imperialism, not just about Russian imperialism against Ukraine, not just Russian imperialism against Ukraine, not just about Western imperialism, however we understand it. It's, it's a class conflict behind it. And the intermixing of the uh, domestic class conflict but also with the uh, incorporation of the transnational capital with which the, this quasi-Jacobin uh, middle-class professionals are allied. And in this conflict, Putin uh, protects the collective rational interests of the Russian ruling class of political capitalists who would uh, fail as a class in case of the Russian defeat. And uh, we would we could understand the development of the war, or at least the processes that led to the war, via discussion of the hegemony crisis on uh, multiple levels. Not simply on the level of post-Soviet countries, but we could start from the global level. Uh, there is a crisis of the United States hegemony, which provides an opportunity for the uh, Russian ruling class to improve their positions in the hierarchy of the global elites. Uh, the people are tired from the United States, and especially they are tired about them in the global south. And there have been a series of uh, very significant defeats of the US in Afghanistan. The, uh, Trump rule, we can name many, many events which led to this. And this is an opportunity for the Russian political capitalists 
to improve their relative, uh, relative position, to mark the territory where they can claim the monopoly sovereign rule. On the regional level, on the level of the post-Soviet space, it's more about resources. If you cannot claim a kind of like a soft power, hegemony is also like a soft power is a part of hegemony. Uh, which you, when you are not capable to present an attractive vision of Russia to the peripheral post-Soviet elites, what is left for you is coercion. And in some cases, police is enough. In case of Ukraine, they need to use much heavier violence. And on the domestic level, it's a threat. Yes, Maidan revolutions, they were not challenging the ruling class per se. However, they uh, weakened the state that became vulnerable to the uh, pressure uh, from the uh, powerful enemies of the uh, uh, post-Soviet political capitalists, both directly and indirectly. In Ukrainian case, directly from the uh, Western powers, representing the transnational capitalist class, and indirectly by, uh, from the uh, from their soft power institutionalized in the uh, NGOized civil society. Both of them, they are united in the so-called anti-corruption agenda. And if you think about what is anti-corruption, what is transparency, this uh, is uh, the uh, fundamental threat to the uh, major competitive advantage of the post-Soviet political capitalists. The revolution itself is not a threat, but it undermines the state which makes the ruling class more vulnerable. And so this threat is resolved in the war. So what, what, what is going forward? Uh, at stake now is the existence of a sovereign center of capital accumulation in the post-Soviet region. One scenario of the development of this culmination of hegemony crisis is basically the post-Soviet disintegration. When we would really say farewell to the post-Soviet region, just goodbye. There would be indeed nothing in common between the different parts of the former Soviet Union and the elites and also the masses would uh, realign themselves to the politics of the EU, of the US, of China in Central Asia, and in, in some extreme scenarios we can speak about so-called decolonization of Russia. That's what is actually seriously is discussed uh, as uh, one of the goals to disintegrate this, to, to finish the, that process that started in 1917 with the disintegration of the Russian Empire, continued in 1991 with the disintegration of the Soviet Union and uh, may end in 2020s with the disintegration of the Russian Federation. Or the, uh, in the process of the war, the Russian ruling class would be capable to move to a higher stage of its political and ideological organization. It could become more hegemonic. It could become more powerful, consolidated, and capable to mobilize more stable, active support, at least from a significant part of the Russian society. What happens now is a kind of like knocking out of the old pillar of Putin's regime, the promise of stability, that he did not have any major breakthroughs in Russia. However, it doesn't become worse. Now, with all the sanctions and all the consequences of the war, it actually may become worse. And this requires from the Russian ruling class to build another pillars of its rule. Now, promising not 
stability, but some transformation. And uh, there's also a more theoretical argument to this uh, made uh, by the sociologists like Beverly Silver or by uh, another American sociologist, Dylan Riley, that uh, the imperialist rivalry is actually conducive for hegemony. When the imperial powers compete with each other, they need to mobilize the support from the subaltern classes. They are not competing simply militarily. They may start to compete in some positive terms, as it actually happened during the Cold War, when there was a competition not simply in the number of the nuclear weapons, but also in the space race, also in science and technology, also in support of the third world countries. And if you're entering into another cycle of the imperial competition, uh, it's quite plausible that we may see the return of hegemony, an organic solution for the hegemony crisis. And another stage that uh, the hegemonizing of the ruling classes may help to build stronger counter hegemonies from below. And that means that even if the Russian ruling class is, would now be capable to consolidate its rule in Russia in case they withstand or even win this war, they may sow the seeds over much more dangerous to them, much stronger, much more socially consciousness, much more radical uh, revolutionary threat that than any of our countries have ever seen for decades. The seeds of a new social, let's call it neo-Jacobin revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions or comments already? Yeah, uh, thanks honestly uh, for your insights. It was very interesting, especially because the yeah, topic is so depressing uh, nowadays um, with the war. And uh, I like very much your perspective um, to describe the processes going on, um, for example, in the transformation after the 1990s in, in Russia, but also in Ukraine as revolutions, because we often uh, used to see revolutions just as such, if they are kind of successful, whatever that means, and that's not my perspective. I understand your thoughts like um, we have to see on the processes of societal transformation, especially also if there's an opposition to capital and state and so on. Yeah, I like this perspective. And um, I don't know if I have a question or if it's uh, just something um, I wonder about when you uh, were talking in your first part on the Soviet regime, where you um, had the, um, the idea or the, the view that there was in fact a, a communist hegemony, which was um, um, which was that strong that even the um, yeah left radical opposition um, was um, criticizing the regime by uh, being not, however, uh, socialist enough and so on. Um, for me, it's a bit uh, unclear this question if it's right. Or uh, in my perspective, is uh, that the uh, uh, I would agree to say, okay, there was somehow a communist hegemony, but that was not uh, the hegemony of, for example, the party regime. And so, in fact, the uh, communist status regime undermines its own hegemony in the spaces by, for example, um, sending some peasants as uh, kulaken into the gulag and so on. So they, they worked on uh, undermining the hegemony which was in society in the spaces um, yeah, I don't know if, uh, if it's clear, it's not a real question, but um, yeah, maybe I have some doubts uh, on this description that there was in fact a communist hegemony, but uh, 
uh, or to say it another way, if there was one, I would not uh, um, stick it to the, for example, the Bolshevist party so much. But maybe I didn't get you right at this point. Uh, should I answer? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. That's actually very important, and it's it's a great question, and that's what we. Uh, thinking about right now, and yeah, for many people it's not obvious that the Communist Party had a hegemony uh, in uh, in the Soviet society, and the question of terror and massive violence in the 1930s, and not only in the 1930s, is of course one of the important counter arguments. Uh, the thing is that uh, for, hegem for 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 Gramsci, but also like not not simply. Mm, not relying simply on the authority of Gramsci, but even uh, s s developing this, the concept of hegemony. Uh, hegemony is, uh, uh, hegemonic rule cannot rely simply on the consent, because uh, it would be simply something, uh, some kind of totally utopian society. In every society you have coercion, you have violence, you have the, 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 the conflicts that are resolved by, by coercion. And uh, hegemony is not simply the lack of coercion, which is not happening in any real world societies, but it's a combination of coercion with something more. With, also, with let's say, coercion against kulaks, but at the same time, mobilization of active consent of the poor peasants. And uh, many people were killed or were sent to Gulag. That's true. At the same time, many people experienced the um, fundamental transformation of their lives. Uh, moving from the uh, illiterate peasants, who most of them they were in the 1920s, to the uh, urban citizens in the post-war society. And they experienced that part of their lives as the uh, they, they, they did have consent about this. And which does not deny the uh, importance of violence. It does not deny the, all, all the facts of violence. But it also helps to see that what else happened besides violence. Because we, we can actually have just violence with only passive consent. And this, this, this comparison between the uh, Soviet Union before 1960s and post-Soviet societies it would, would point us not only to the scale of terror, we are not experiencing that level of violence right now, central, yeah, hopefully. Uh, but at the same time, we lack something. We lack that active, enthusiastic mobilization. We lack this uh, experience of, the, of moving forward of revolutionary change, of the transformation, when in the, in the, uh, in the length of, in, in, the, in the duration of like years, of most decades, the lives of uh, the masses of citizens are changing in fundamental ways, as it happened in the period of between 1930s till 1960s. What we experience is 30 years of the degradation and collapse, and which ends into in the, in the horrible war. Thank you very much for your talk. I have two questions. Um, one would be about the material um, interwovenness um, in the post-Soviet uh, region. Because one of the, as far as I understand, one of the argumentation lines in Russian state propaganda is that there were bilateral kind of contracts in, in the post-Soviet, early post-Soviet stage, and that there were certain um, 
binding contracts and terms that were very much about, for example, power stations and, I don't know, trains and whatever. And then how far you would say that this um, and the indebtedness of like the post-Soviet or with the post-Soviet collapse in how far this redistribution also is um, forming one of the materialist reasons for the invasion. And the other one is kind of um, come or like um, interwoven with my first question and how far the Ukrainian oligar or ruling class or oligarchs are um, connected with Russians ruling class. So because because you you talked about the post-Soviet region as somehow that, well, yeah, as one region and then dividing into these uh, new nation states with different kind of political developments, but then looking also at what combines them or what, what connects them and, and how far this also plays a role in these Maidan revolutions or the question of power in, uh, for example, the Ukraine. I don't know if my, yeah. Yeah, if, yeah I've got the yeah, question. Okay. Thank, Thank you. So you. Thank you so much. That's so, yeah, the, also very important question and could be actually very illuminating. So the, um, about the, um, not sure what you meant by contracts, uh, but the uh, interconnectedness of the uh, post-Soviet economy was of course one of the, uh, it's, it's, it's a fact because this was one state and uh, which developed its economy in a centralized way. And when it started to be divided, it had a very like, painful consequences for the disruption of the economic routes and uh, trade links and so on. It was a, a very important part of the post-Soviet uh, crisis. And the uh, some fundamental connections that uh, exist uh, existed and st still are important between the former parts of the formerly uh, unified economy, uh, I believe is, a, is at least part of the reasons why uh, Ukrainian integration into the Western-led institutions, uh, EU, NATO, is actually uh, um, more dangerous let, than, let's say, Finnish joining NATO. Although Finland has the border, which is just 150 kilometers far from St. Petersburg, and all that, uh, that, which makes all the discussions about how many minutes a rocket needs to fly to Moscow a little bit uh, ridiculous. Uh, and why Putin is much calmer, because Finland may join NATO, but uh, makes a, a war because of U Ukraine, very low chances to join NATO. Uh, but uh, the economy of Finland cannot be so easily integrated into the, into the Russian political capitalism. And of course, in Ukraine, there are still some uh, uh, valuable for the uh, Russian economy pieces of industry which could be very easily incorporated into formerly unified economy. As uh, it actually happened in, in uh, these puppet states in Donbass, in Donetsk and Lugansk, in the eastern Ukraine, which just a matter of years we were overtaken by the uh, political capitalist close to the former Ukrainian regime of Viktor Yanukovych, but also to the Russian state. And so that could be a very much likely future for the occupied Ukrainian territories. They're overtaken at least of those parts of the industry which would remain mm, not destroyed, unlike in Mariupol, uh, into the uh, Russian economy. And th th that would be much easier than taking over the uh, Western European economy. So that's, that's my, um, my idea about this. And about the Ukrainian ruling class uh, and their connections to Russia, the, 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 uh, genealogically, in their origins, they are this, the, the, the same kind of post-Soviet political capitalists who also the, uh, exploited the connections to the old Soviet nomenclature in order to become very rich in a matter of years. They instrumentalized Ukrainian nationalism in order to legitimize their claim 
for the part of the collapsing Soviet state, uh, not really believing very much into, in the Ukrainian national idea, and they had actually a very big problem how to I identify Ukraine in a positive way. And the title of a book of uh, Ukrainian second president, Leonid Kuchma, is very illust illustrative, uh, is very telling. In this respect, uh, he called the book, Ukraine is not Russia. Okay, Ukraine is not Russia, but what is Ukraine then? And until this moment, they, they did have the, the, this problem with hegemony crisis. They could not articulate a positive development project that they would be able to lead and that would represent the interest of the whole nations. So these professional middle classes, they did have a kind of like quasi modernization, ersatz modernization project uh, that we are joining EU, we are joining proper capitalism, we are joining the civilized world, and so we, we, will, we are going to live at least not, at least as good as Poland or Czech Republic. Of course, this would not happen. Uh, and they, will, uh, they, they also did have the problem of hegemonizing their interests, and that's what I've just been talking about. But the uh, connections of the Ukrainian ruling class to the Russian ruling class, they, uh, they exist on the genealogical level, and they uh, also they could compete on the, um, on the uh, about s in certain economic spheres even, even now. Although I would not uh, see this uh, war as, I mean, some dogmatic left may present it as like Russian oligarchs fighting against Ukrainian oligarchs. I believe it's, it, it, there is a class conflict behind it, but it's, it's very different class conflict. Uh, Ukrainian ruling class was actually divided about the, uh, uh, the uh, prospects in relation to the uh, transnational capital, which was coming uh, with the anti-corruption agenda, and so a part of Ukrainian ruling class took the clearly a confrontationist position, and they were trying to claim the sovereignty, that all this anti-corruption is simply some, some kind of like George Soros conspiracy, and so on and so forth. Uh, they actually failed. Uh, Another part of Ukrainian oligarchs, they were t trying to take uh, an accommodationist straight strategy, so that, uh, yes, of course, we are joining the civilized world, uh, but uh, we need to understand that if you uh, start to look into the offshore accounts of Poroshenko or Zelensky, just before the war, there was this Pandora paper scandal with Zelensky's offshores, which nobody uh, remembers now about and nobody cares now about because this is the war and if you start to criticize Zelensky, you are helping Putin. And so if uh, you are capable to sell yourself as the some indispensable figure in fight against Putin, the people would just close their eyes on, on your own corruption. Uh, so that's, that's uh, how it is in very broad strokes. Um, the next question um, has been posted in our pad, um, so I read it out. When you talked about hegemonic crisis, you pointed the limited opportunities for hegemony under demodernizing changes out. Can you explain what you exactly mean with demodernizing in this context? And is modernization then always a condition of hegemony? Yeah, okay, great question. What is demodernization in the post-Soviet societies? When you, um, when you have a high added uh, value economy, uh, which was capable to produce uh, space rockets, computers, um, advanced machines, and which are uh, basically sold for, pay, sold for pennies in the 1990s and uh, are not needed anymore. And the economy is uh, degraded uh, into the uh, extraction and sell of the uh, very low added value goods. 
In Russian case, this, the fundamentals of the economy, gas and oil. In Ukrainian case, it was kind of metallurgy, but also on the quite low level of development. And so, instead of the uh, technological advance in economy, you've got the degradation of the economy. Demodernization in this case. In political level, uh, you have the uh, politicized uh, society, you have uh, like degrading but still ideological party, which articulates some uh, clear ideologies. As a result, you get the uh, uh, politics dominated by uh, personalistic patronage networks and interests. From more complicated politics, you get more primitive politics. On the level of culture, the um, number of people who read books, who read press, the number of uh, intelligent press declines. The uh, return of the multiple uh, um, problems that were actually at least temporarily solved in the Soviet Union, on the level of health care, let's say, on the level of basic education, returning back. So these are all the uh, things that uh, I would call demodernization. The, um, when, yeah, Gramsci could, could say about this as, as history goes back instead of going forward. And uh, that's why, uh, yeah, I believe that all the discussion about the passive revolution is, is, is very misleading. And uh, whether the uh, hegemony is necessarily, um, should be combined with the modernization, yeah, good question, I, I didn't s think it through yet. But I would say that, uh, that modernization is, is indeed something very uh, beneficial for the hegemony because you uh, have more opportunities to connect the interests of the different groups uh, who could give an active, rational, participatory consent in the societal change. When the uh, demoniz demodernization process happens, there are less uh, opportunities to um, at least partially fulfill the interests of other groups. So whether it's a uh, very strong necessity connection, not sure, but this is definitely, uh, modernization is definitely uh, very conducive to the possibilities for hegemony. And demodernization reduces these opportunities. Um, I have a question um, on the relationship of the ruling classes of Russia or the post-Soviet states uh, towards China and um, because uh, yeah, you said uh, that uh, the, the American hegemony is shrinking and uh, that um, the Russian war, if, it's, uh, if Russia is uh, victorious, that it, might strengthen, that it might strengthen the position of the ruling classes of Russia. And yeah, that's also the question on how the ruling class is uh, structured in Russia because uh, I think that the uh, conflict is not just a regional uh, Eastern European conflict, but also a representation of uh, some historic uh, global transformation process where the uh, world economic power is uh, concentrating more in China, and China is becoming uh, the new center of uh, world market regulations, uh, not just because other countries are tired, but also because uh, of 
uh, the, uh, that we are since the 70s uh, in a structural over-accumulation of capital because of uh, modernization and uh, the problem of uh, effective demand for uh, uh, on the one side on the one hand and uh, higher product productivity and uh, a rising output of um, productive capital and uh, yeah so I think uh, that the that this is also this transformation process is also a representation of the economic loss that uh, the, that capitalism is uh, going to an end and I also think that this makes it more uh, 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 that, that there is a rising necessity of the state to uh, do state intervention and uh, uh, deficit, deficit spending or other things. So a transformation, so that there is a transformation process toward some kind of socialist market economy. Maybe, I don't know, but uh, so that's why I'm asking that if um, Russia is winning the war in the Ukraine, that it may boost this pro transformation. Uh, the Russian, uh, let's say, international oriented ideology right now is very non hegemonic. So they actually they need to present their war as the war for not just for Russia, but for other nations who are dissatisfied with the U.S. order, or U.S.-led order, or U.S. hegemony. But at the same time, they do not have any positively articulated pro project for the world, and for the world. And what they articulate now is the uh, kind of like civilizational ideology. So, we are kind of like an ancient Russian civilization, so we have some legitimate claims on a part on the part of the within, within China that could claim some re return to the uh, socialist development on whatever on whatever basis. So that 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 what I would tell on this question. All right. Um, thanks very much again, Volodymyr, for your talk, and thank you for participating in the discussion. And we will continue at nine with another performance. Thank you. Und ich möchte noch mal kurz den DIY-Charakter unseres kleinen Festivals ansprechen. Die Küche freut sich heute wieder sehr über zwei, drei Menschen, die ja bei der Essensausgabe und später beim Abwasch helfen. Äh, wenn ihr darauf Lust und gerade Zeit habt, kommt einfach kurz zu mir oder geht zur Küche. Danke.
that you would move to the sun Cause you like digging holes and thin air And we know that can't be done I mean, I wish that you would cheat with someone Cause you like digging holes in water And we know that can't be done Bravery and stupidity go hand in hand And I guess that makes me the bravest man Cause I was quick to learn but slow to understand Well, what can you do? Our fears are all bought from somewhere else And I've never had too many to talk about Cause you were real quick and you were quick to point out Well, that was borrowed too I, I wish that you would move to the sun Cause you like digging holes in water and we know that can't be done I, I wish that you would cheat with someone cause you like digging holes in thin air and we know that can't be done